role here in this community and i thank you very much for that but clearly tonight's discussion is is very very important and i promise you everything that's said tonight will get back to albany and so your voices will be heard there but certainly we know that our children's future depends on the kinds of decisions we make tonight and in the coming months and common core is it will continue to be a big discussion i'm sure but with that i'm going to turn this over to our colleague our friend assemblyman ed ra again from long island our ranking member on the education committee and thank you very much jane uh number one i want to thank jane certainly and uh all of the western new york members uh as well as uh the regional office staff for and jane staff for their work in putting this together um this is the sixth uh forum that myself uh and my colleague al graf as members of the education committee uh, have participated in uh, we have about six more uh, still scheduled uh, we'll be uh, in rochester tomorrow night we've already conducted a few down on long island and we've been working our way uh, up the state we were in syracuse last night um, and if there's been one common thread through all of those hearings it's been a lot of just concern amongst parents amongst teachers amongst administrators uh, as to the state of education reform in new york and it is our belief certainly on our side of the aisle in the assembly that there's no better way to hear feedback on what's going on and try to advocate for uh, policy changes uh, both legislatively and through uh, the state department of education than from hearing uh, from the people who are dealing with it firsthand be they people that work in the schools be they educators or be they parents who are uh, dealing with you know the uh, concerns of their students their children as they come home each day whether it's preparing for a test whether it's uh, doing homework uh, and getting used to doing so in a, in a whole new way uh, in a lot of these areas um, and i just hope that uh, tonight's uh, forum which i know will be as productive for us as the past five have been i hope it's uh, as productive for all of you as well um, that you know you leave here feeling like your voices are being heard and that you also leave here realizing that tonight should be part of a continuing conversation not feeling like you've uh, said your piece and and that's it because i think we have a long way to go in uh in making sure the voices of, of parents teachers administrators are being heard on this issue um, so that we we make sure anything we're doing within our schools um, gives due deference especially to the teachers uh, and the students so that their classroom experience is the best it possibly can be uh, here in new york state um, so with that um, i will pass it back to jane so that my colleagues can uh, make their opening remarks and i'm looking forward to hearing from all of you here tonight thank you thanks ed uh, next i'd like to introduce al graf uh, he's an assembly member from long island as well a member of the education committee and a long distance driver hi thank you for letting us come here and thanks for coming out tonight this has been in the beginning back in june we looked to get a conversation going about where education was going in New York. And I put in a bill to actually withdraw from Common Core and Race to the Top. <laughs> and the one thing I can say is, I mean, one of my biggest advocates, I think, or is uh, the Commission of Education. Because every time he goes out there and speaks, more people become aware of what's going on. And, uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing from you tonight. And the one thing I can say, it's amazing. They have united people throughout the state. There are mothers talking to each other and becoming friends from all corners of the state. They're all communicating with, it, communicating with each other. And this is in large part been due to mothers out there that are looking at what's going on with their children and what's going on in their schools. And, uh, their voices are being heard. And the idea of this forum is to give you an opportunity to speak to us, to let your voice be heard. We're not looking to cut people off. We're not looking to, to guide the conversation, all right? We're coming out to you and saying, talk to us. Let us hear what's going on in your home. Let us hear what's going on in your schools. Let us hear how this is affecting you, if it's positive or it's negative. Like Ed said, we've been uh, quite a bit all over the state, and whether it's Staten Island, whether it's Long Island, whether it's
in central New York or, or out here, we're hearing a lot of the same stories. And trust me, we're listening. So again, thank you very much for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Assemblyman Joe Giglio. Good evening. Thank you for coming. As my colleagues have said, we're here to listen, hopefully make a bad bill or a bad program better. And it's going to be your ideas and your input that make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is David DiPietro. I'm from Southern Erie and all of Wyoming County. And again, I would like to thank Al and Ed for coming out, taking their time. They do great work up in Albany for you. And just reiterating, we are here to listen. We know there are problems and we want to find a way to solve it so that when we go back into Albany in January, we can uh, tackle this problem. Thanks, Dan. Uh, let's see, who am I missing here? <laughs> Our assemblyman was Steve Hawley and then Ray Walter. That's great to be here this evening. I'm not sure. Are these working? Test two, three. No, they're not. They do look good, though, don't they? The microphones. Uh, we're all here today because we uh, share a common goal, uh, providing a world-class education for our children. Uh, the Common Core is a major educational reform with the intent of helping us reach that goal. But as with any substantial change, many problems and concerns have been raised since its implementation. The purpose of this meeting is to bring all of the affected groups together, parents, teachers, administrators, and students so we can identify the successes and failures of the program and how we can reach our goal of improving education in all of New York. As an eight-year member of the Genesee Valley BOCES Board of Education, I have seen firsthand how illuminating this kind of event can be. More voices at the table to help deliver more perspective and insight in our effort to get this right for our kids. In August, I organized a meeting with Deshaun Wright, the Deputy Secretary for State Education, and more than 20 local superintendents and Board of Education members. This was a very productive conversation that touched on many important subjects, but it seemed like we always kept coming back to the topic, the Common Core. This is an issue on the mind of every parent and educator who work tirelessly to make sure that the children in their care are receiving the best chance for future success. Education has been a personal priority of mine since becoming an elected official. Having been named the 2008 Assembly Freshman of the Year by the New York State School Board Association, I have a long-standing relationship with the stakeholders here today, and I have complete faith in our ability to straighten out the problems we've seen in implementing Common Core. At the conclusion of tonight's event, I'm hopeful that we will all feel as though we've learned something, something about the challenges our teachers are facing in teaching this new curriculum, something about the problems our parents are having in dealing with an unaccountable education bureaucracy, something about the pressure our children are under facing these new tests. The bottom line is that when we can bring this large crowd together, sharing a common goal to help New York's students, only good can come out of our efforts. I look forward to a productive and illuminating discussion tonight. And now, Ray Walter. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Jane, for hosting us here in your district in uh, Akron. I, I used to represent uh, Akron and Newstead when I was in the county legislature, so it's good to be home. Uh, but now I represent uh, Amherst, uh, so I have the uh, Williamsville School District, Amherst School District, Sweet Home School District, and, and I also represent Pendleton in Niagara County, so I have the Star Point School District. So. Uh, I'm glad to see some familiar faces here that we'll be hearing from in a, in a little while. Uh, this issue really hit home with me uh, earl earlier in the year. We did a, a mailing asking people to express their opinions about some of the testing that's been going on in school. And uh, the responses that we received were overwhelming, overwhelmingly negative, and really raised a red flag uh, to me about what's going on with our educational system. The second thing was I participated in a forum with the Partnership for Smarter Schools at Klein Hands Music Hall earlier in the year, about a month ago, a month and a half, and uh, 2,500 people very concerned about the direction of our educational system. And I think it's, uh, it's extremely important that unlike the Education Commissioner, that we're here to listen to you. So thank you 
very much for being here, for participating, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. All right, great, well thank you very much. Um, the first person to get up and speak uh, is Mike Cornell. Uh, I believe he is the principal of Amherst Middle School and also heads up the uh, Partnership for Smarter Schools. And I am looking for Mike. Here he is, come on up. Uh, Mike, if you don't mind just stepping up to the podium, I'd appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the members of the Assembly Minority Conference for hosting the forum, especially those uh, who have come from a great distance to join us here in Western New York. Welcome to you. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you find this issue important enough to travel the state to seek input from educators and parents on the impact of the current reform agenda. Thank you for the invitation to share my experiences and understandings with respect to the current reform initiative. I am the principal of Amherst Middle School, as Jane said, Please note the comments are my own and should not be considered the policy of the Amherst Central School District. <laughs> Just have to put that disclaimer out there. <laughs> they haven't yet taken a position and it's not for me to do for them, so. Uh, altogether, I spent 20 years as a middle school principal, a high school social studies teacher, and uh, I oversaw a district-wide staff development program and served as a department chair. These multiple perspectives on the current reforms caused me to join stakeholders from all over Western New York to join the Partnership for Smarter Schools. It is on their behalf that I offer my remarks tonight. This kind of advocacy, advocacy to suggest alternatives to the current policies of the New York State Education Department is frankly a little bit uncomfortable. For the better part of my 20 years, I worked with my colleagues actively to support the State Education Department to implement various standards, movements, and changes in student assessment. I'd much prefer to carry out my work as a principal, confident in the research around the reforms offered by policymakers, and feeling really positive about the fact that they'll have a, a, you know, a, a positive effect on my students. Unfortunately, like many teachers and administrators, I find myself following the directives, working furiously to mitigate their negative impacts by day, and advocating for change by night. My advocacy, which includes, thank you. <laughs> my advocacy, which includes helping form the partnership, is fueled by my intense desire to help every child learn. But I do that mindful of the fact that the policymakers want the same thing. So while we share a desire to help every child learn, I think we have very different ideas about how to accomplish that and how we should measure it. My advocacy has led me to deep understandings of the reform agenda its genesis and its basis of research. And you're gonna find me talking a lot about the research. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the boys and girls at Amherst Middle School, who I love to talk about and brag about as much as I can. But what I really wanna talk about is the research and the basis for what we're doing. We should base our research. I harp on my teachers all the time about best practice and research. And that's what we should be doing in our schools and it bothers me when we don't. So you'll hear me refer to the research uh, quite a bit. It's important to understand first that the current reform is supported by an often repeated narrative about our schools. I'll repeat it briefly, you've heard it before. New Yorkers are being led to believe that student test results have proven that their public schools prepare large, fail to adequately pre pre prepare large percentages of students for life after high school, which is causing us to fall behind the rest of the world. We're being told that the score that a child receive, receives on a high state standardized test in fifth grade can somehow tell us whether or not that child is on a path to be college and career ready. And finally, New Yorkers are being told that high state's test-based accountability for children and teachers is critical to the improvement of public education. Now, I read a great book not long ago, maybe you've heard of it, called uh, The Signal and the Noise, written by a guy named, named uh, Nate Silver, who gained renown for accurately predicting presidential elections. And there was a really interesting book for a lot of reasons. And he tells us the signal is the truth. And the noise is that which distracts us from the truth. And clearly many of New Yorkers have identified this narrative as the noise. They're not buying it. They don't believe it. And it's distracting us from the truth. My remarks tonight will point out the research behind the noisiness 
reform narrative and offer a way forward. I appreciate so much the fact that the membership here is focused on solutions. And one of the things that I hope to do tonight is offer a solution that the Partnership for Smarter Schools has developed. We represent hundreds of stakeholders from all walks of life in Western New York, and uh, we've worked together to develop um, a set of, of ideas that we think might form the framework for a way forward. So we'll present that uh, to you tonight. The current reform, in fact, has a very limited basis in our recent experience and in research to indicate its success. In fact, there are few, if any, examples of successful, large-scale, sustained implementation of a program that includes this combination of reforms. And I say large-scale because there's a very narrow band, a slim body of research, that is really limited to charter schools. And you'll hear that talked about quite a lot, but understand that's a very narrow, limited band of research that supports the brand of reform that's being suggested here in New York. There is no evidence that students in countries who outperform American students on their national tests do so because those countries test their students more often or hold their teachers accountable for student test scores. Most researchers agree, most notably here in Western New York, we have a great guy, Dr. Jack Lee, who is the dean of the UB Graduate School of Education. He spoke at the, part, at the Summit for Smarter Schools in October that Ray referenced. Um, he stood and, and spoke eloquently about that simple fact, and he has a great perspective from which to view, the, view those international comparisons. And he says that the success that, that other countries might experience is due to other factors, not anything related to the way that we use student test scores to measure student uh, achievement and measure teacher effectiveness. And take Finland, for example. Finland is often offered up to us as a model to follow. Finland does not make frequent use of standardized tests and does not use student performance to evaluate teachers. So as we hold up these models for, a great, for success and we should follow them, we need to look at the whole thing. We can't cherry pick. And the simple fact of the matter is they don't test their students often and they don't use student performance to evaluate teachers. Clear consensus in the research around student growth percentiles, which is what we use to, to evaluate teachers on the state portion of the 20%, and value-added me measurement is that these models are not reliable, they're too volatile, and are invalid measures of teacher effectiveness. I know I have limited time, I'm not gonna bore you with the research. I have three little snippets that I wanna share. I share them again only to emphasize the fact that the research against what we're doing is significant. And these are three pretty well-renowned folks. You can find uh, their work on, on the internet. And, and most importantly, you can find their work in peer-reviewed journals. And that's a critically important point because when you look at research, you want to make sure that the methodology is valid. And you want to make sure that the research is, is reliable. So I chose these three for that reason. Bruce Baker from Rutgers and his team summed up the findings on student growth percentiles by saying that Two recent working papers compare student growth percentiles and value-added me measurements for teacher and school evaluations. Both raise concerns about the face validity of the statistical properties, which basically means the math doesn't work. The math doesn't work. For the purpose of starting conversations about student achievement, student growth percentiles might be a useful tool. But one might wish to use something different for rewarding teacher performance or making high stakes teacher decisions. He added that even when you put the value added pieces of it in, and you've heard a little bit about value added if you follow the issue, his research says that teacher scores reflect student demographics more than they reflect teacher effectiveness. So the thing that's disappointing is you're being told that this is a way to accurately measure the effectiveness of your teachers, because what do we want? We all want effective teachers for our children. The simple reality is that the composite effectiveness score falls a little bit short of doing what they say because the simple math doesn't work out. He concludes by saying that these measures lack face validity to such a degree that a teacher dismissed based on them would invite a challenge based on a teacher's constitutional Fourth Amendment right to due process. And this is a pretty well-renowned researcher writing this in a peer-reviewed journal. So that's a significant piece to, to note. Linda Darling Hammond from Stanford summarized her suggestions for using value-added measurements saying, the prospective value-added measurements of student achievement tied to individual teachers 
Current research suggests that high stakes individual level decisions for comparisons across highly dissimilar schools. That's what we do. We compare teachers who work in dissimilar schools with dissimilar student populations. She says that those comparisons should be avoided. Even in light of those conclusions and dozens like them, the most convincing evidence came from the State Education Department's own website. Now I'm gonna suggest you do this. If you go on Engage New York, many of you have probably been there, and type in the little search box, research supporting all components of teacher and principal evaluation. You're gonna get a list of 33 items, okay? I was surprised when I looked at this, because I figured this is where I'm gonna find all the stuff, right, all that I've been looking for that will tell me why we're doing this. What I found is there really isn't any peer-reviewed research, like the two pieces I read to you, that supports what we're doing. No success stories highlighting how a program using external accountability like what we're doing helps improve learning outcomes. <coughs> No documentation describing research derived from piloting common core learning standards so we can benefit from lessons learned. In fact, there are no endorsements at all from anyone who thought that what we were doing was a really good idea. Now, if that stuff existed, wouldn't it be on the website? It's just not there. That was a little bit scary to me. Because again, I've been a good soldier for 20 years. And it's tough when you look on the website you're looking for all the stuff that supports what's going on, and you don't find it. It's a little disappointing. So we spent the last few months admiring the problem. We've seen the reports, and if you follow Twitter, you can see you know, the Poughkeepsie meeting, and hopefully many of you were at the Summit for Smarter Schools. And we spent a lot of time reviewing the research and admiring the problem. And one of the things that I think, again, is great is, is to focus on solutions. And I want to take a minute before I close to talk a little bit about a solution that the Partnership for Smarter Schools would like to offer up as a framework for a way forward. Now, you, you've seen some uh, press releases from, from Saney's, which represents uh, school administrators, and from NYSIT, and some other folks arguing for a moratorium. And we think that that is a prudent course to take to pursue a, a revise and review period for about for two years is what we suggested. We've seen different uh, time periods offered up. This allows us to be thoughtful about continuing to implement parts of the plan around which there's consensus, and there is consensus around a couple of pieces of it which I'll, I'll highlight, while modifying the implementation of those parts that need to be changed. A moratorium is not the final answer. Stopping is not the final answer. We need to move forward to something, but we need to move forward to something in a thoughtful way. Moratorium gives us time and space to have a public conversation about how to make sure that curriculum instruction and assessment supports the learning of every child. We didn't have a conversation about implementing the Common Core. We didn't have a conversation about how we should effectively evaluate the teachers. It was, it was handed to us in exchange for $700 million. And it's time. <laughs> I think it would be helpful for all of us if we engaged in a two-way conversation like the one that's being suggested here so that we can really have a good conversation about how to support the learning of all children in our schools. During the review and revision period, the amount of student assessment would be significantly scaled back. First, we would take, and this will be a little bit technical, I'll try to make it simple, all, take all New York State assessments and make them program assessments which is to say we wouldn't use them as measures of student learning, so we wouldn't put kids in AIS just based on that, and we wouldn't use them to evaluate teacher effectiveness. They'd be program assessments to evaluate the overall effectiveness of the curriculum instruction happening in schools, which is, the, that's the way we use st state assessments up until a couple of years ago. So we'd go back to something a lot like that. We'd support eliminating all state assessments in, for children in third grade and below. We suggest that we limit the assessments for ELA in and math to one day, not three. Three days is a little bit silly. And if you, have, if you ever have to work in the school, if you ever have to work in a school where you basically light a month on fire 
for state assessments. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not a good use of time and it's not, frankly, a good use of taxpayer dollars either. Um, we would, the time allotted for assessments would be scaffolded from 60 minutes for fourth graders up to 120 minutes for seventh and eighth graders. Proficiency levels would be set based on a raw score, not a scaled score. We would set that level uh, prior to administration, not after. Teams of practitioners, teams of practitioners from public schools, colleges, and universities would either be the primary designers of assessments or at least finalize. Let's have people in the field take a look at these assessments before we put them out there to make sure that they're developmentally appropriate for children because we've seen the problems, you know, the tortoise and the hare, or whatever it was, the pineapple and the hare, you know, that, I mean, it's well documented and there's a way to avoid that. And we ought to take advantage of the resources we have here with very good practitioners to do that. And all tests and answers will be made publicly available immediately upon administration. We'd suggest that state education departments cease all their plans to share data beyond what they historically have done with BOCES, the department, and the regional information centers. You know, Dr. Marchloff, I think, has spoken eloquently about the need to really take a good, hard look at how we're using student data when it goes beyond the schoolhouse. And I think that's critical. We're also suggesting some sort of a shared decision-making process consistent with the commissioner's regulations for shared decision-making uh, that would empower district and local superintendents to work with stakeholder groups to carry out a systematic review of learning standards, professional review standards, and existing you know, pending policy decisions. All districts and BOCES are required to seek out and give meaningful consideration to this kind of feedback and we think that the State Education Department would reap the benefit from a reliable and ongoing dialogue with committed stakeholders around the state. Also, during the review period, we would keep the 60-point multiple measures score as it's in teacher contracts now. Um, that way we don't totally upset the apple cart um, and try to find a way to use what's there. And I think most would agree that the um, the rubrics that are out there and the rubrics that teachers are using are at least consistent with the New York State teaching standards. I think most people agree that the New York State teaching standards are pretty good. And frankly, I think they're pretty good because there was a two-way conversation that resulted in their adoption instead of the one-way top-down uh, process that gave us uh, the rest of it. We would eliminate the use of student learning objectives. There's really no research basis for um, them telling us anything meaningful about uh, a teacher's effectiveness. We also support limiting the Common Core Learning Standards to a series of pilots jointly run by SED and volunteer districts. The pilot per period would include a full review of the standards by local and district superintendents and their stakeholder groups. And we need to do this, I think, because it would help us evaluate the degree to which the documented problems associated with the Common Core are a result of the standards themselves or a result of the implementation of the standards. It's one or the other. And unless we stop and figure out which one it is and then use those understandings and move forward, we're never really going to get anywhere. And it also accepts and acknowledges what I think we all at least agree with, is some districts are ready to take the Common Core standards move forward with them. And if that's a local decision to do that, then they should be able to do that work with SED to move ahead with those Common Core Learning Standards. If the board, the superintendent, and the stakeholder groups in that district want to do that, then they should be able to go ahead and do that. And then other districts can learn from their leadership and their experience in implementing the Common Core. So we offer that as a framework, some ideas. You know, we, we appreciate the anxiety and uh, the anger, frankly, that people have around testing in the Common Core. And uh, we're really anxious for the day that we can move beyond that because the energy, while worthy and important, it'll, it, you know, it, it'll be so much better spent we can focus on solutions and, and moving ahead and doing great things for our kids every day, which is really what we all want. So thank you very much to the members for offering the opportunity for this forum. And thank you very much to all of you for coming. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mike. If I could grab my mic, Mike, can I just grab?
Randy, just for a second. Um, I was at your summit for Smarter Schools, and thank you very much. It was a terrific event, and it was great um, hearing the research, uh, you know, the, the researchers came in. Just a couple of clarifications. I want to make sure that all of our colleagues got to hear what you had to say, because you did say some very important things. Just a real quick clarification for me. We were talking about, in terms of solutions, and I love the idea of solutions, um, combining uh, tests so that you have a program assessment as opposed to lots of individual tests. Do you envision doing something like that, combining Common Core exams with regents? I mean, how, how do we address regents as an issue? Because that's kind of unique for New York State that we have regents. How do you think that fits into the whole um, idea of, of you know, making the schools more effective? Well, the regents exams have been around since I think 1867. So they've had a pretty good long run. And I think that we all agree that there's value to that. What I wouldn't do is start applying arbitrary cut scores to regents' exams in the way that they're doing in the pre-grade exams, because imagine what happens then. If you've got proficiency rates at the level of three through eight, then you see you know, the cascading effect on graduation rates. Um, so I, I think that would be um, problematic. Um, in terms of, of how it fits, um, you know, I'm not sure I have a pat answer for that other than to say I think it's important that we all really sit down and, and decide together what what you know how that how the overall pre-k through 12 assessment looks because I mean it would be naive to say we should do no assessment at all of, of pre-k and kindergartners and first graders but it has to be done in a developmentally appropriate way in a way that provides a diagnosis for strengths and weakness so one of, the, one of the things I think I struggle with is, you know, what they've done with pre-grade assessment gives assessment a bad name. You know, because nobody here is against assessment, you know, but I think we have to do smart, thoughtful assessment. So that, I think that's, you know, that, that's what I would say about regions, is I wouldn't let uh, what they've done with pre-grade assessment um, completely tarnish the value uh, that regions' exams hold. I, like I said, they've had a good long run, and I think that they hold value as a high school teacher and department chair, they held value for me because we, we more or less knew it was going to be there. We knew what the curriculum was. Um, we could look at it after. You could, you could disaggregate data and look at the question itself and understand if there was a problem with the question. You know, you could understand, because it's really about how kids think. You know, when you really look at data, you want to understand how a child think or, or how a young adult thought, I should say, and, and help and use that information to inform your teaching and inform their learning. And the regents' exams offer us at least an opportunity to do that. And I would, I would advocate that we continue to use regents' exams in that way. And I, I think they're a good gatekeeper. They're, they're a reasonable measure of what students know and can do with respect to global studies and chemistry and the like. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Al? I can, but I'm right next to you. All right, thanks, Wayne. Uh, have you taken a look at some of the common core standards that they put in place? Uh, yes. Okay. Now I have a degree. <laughs> I have a degree in elementary education. I've read this. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out who the hell wrote this, because whoever wrote it was never in class. Now, with that said, after reading this. So I'm still trying to get an answer to one question that I've asked all over the state. Can you explain to me why a first grader has to be able to point out where ancient Mesopotamia is on a map or a globe and discuss with me its, its contributions to modern day civilization? There's six. I think I have an answer. Go ahead. You know, it's, I'm going to Carol Burris, if you know Carol Burris, right? She, she did a thing, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal her answer. She did a thing on NPR, the Common Core Learning Standards. And she talked about the fact that the standards are fact-bound, right? So they started from college and career ready, whatever that means, right? It means something to David Coleman and the folks that wrote the Common Core Learning Standard. So they identified college and career ready. And then they back-mapped all the way to first grade, kindergarten, I think they did kindergarten, right? So, they figured out where a kid should be in first grade based on where they think they should be in 
12th grade. You have a 12th grade. The only problem is kids don't grow backwards. And have you, found, this, have you found the curriculum to be age appropriate and developmentally appropriate? No. 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 In general, no. <laughs> no. You, you can find spots where, you know, the, the algebra that a kid learns at a certain grade in middle school makes some sense. Um, but no, it, it's difficult to say, yes, they are developmentally appropriate. That's, you know, you, you do your child's homework. I worked at, my son's in third grade. I worked on his homework last night. There was a question my wife and I couldn't answer. My wife's a teacher too, so. Um, I seem, I seem to be struggling as well. How is the morale in your school when it comes to teachers? How is the morale in your school when it comes to your students right now? You know, I'm gonna give my teachers an awful lot of credit because they come to work every day and they, they put on the smiley face. They, you know, you, you taught, when you teach, you sell. You know, you sell in the curriculum. They do their absolute best every single day to, to work with children and help them feel honored as unique learners, even though the Common Core Learning Standards threatens to kind of standardize the, the instruction and assessment that we provide for children. So they do their absolute best every day to differentiate where they can, to move slow where they have to, and to help every child feel honored as a learner. So I think that helps a lot to the extent that we don't have miserable morale among the teaching ranks and, and students is really a credit to their good hard work. But I know from talking to them, and I'm in the classrooms every day, there's some tough, dark days because they love children and they want them to be successful and feel honored and have efficacy for the learning that they do in school. And there are days when that is really, really tough for them to do, but they find a way to do it. Yeah, but when you teach in the classroom, you try to teach to the middle of the class, and then what happens is you get the secret to reinforce what you've gone over. Then what you'll have is kids that are a little more advanced, you'll give them a little tougher stuff to do to keep them engaged. But that gives you the opportunity to go to the kids that did not get the lesson mm -hmm. and to work with them individually. Because we know kids all learn different ways. Some are textual, they have to write it and write it. Some are visual, they have to see it over and over again. And some, it's auditory, they have to listen to it. So, I mean, what I'm seeing is the way that they're doing Common Core, they're not giving you the opportunity to be able to do that. And a lot of these lesson plans are very structured, saying you're gonna teach five minutes of this, 10 minutes of that, give them this, so we're gonna lose the whole bottom of the class. We may even lose at the top of the class. So if, if you're strictly conforming with what they want you to conform, we're gonna lose a lot of kids here. Would you agree with that? I would agree. I, I had some of my, and I think you're talking about the modules that the State Education Department right. had created. I actually brought one of them with me. It's oh, a third, we've got grade, some here, third grade module. And it's, it's great reading. Um, and it really, it's, we had my, some of my teachers piloted their use. They did a unit, you know, I give them credit. They tried it, they didn't dismiss it out of hand. They did one unit and they said, that, that's it, I'm done. So we did a little action research. I mean, I like to be a lifelong learner, understand the instructional impact of all kinds of things. So they say, oh, Mike, we're gonna give it a try. We'll see how it is. I didn't ask them to do it. They, they did it themselves. They thought it was the right thing to do. They tried it. It did not work, it was not successful. It was very frustrating from a teacher perspective, even more frustrating from a student perspective. And they, they moved on and, and we're using our own locally developed curriculum uh, based on the Common Core Learning Standards, which allows us at least a little bit of flexibility to differentiate. But I'll say this too, from a funding perspective, what we find is the differentiation doesn't really happen as much in the classroom, in the proper classroom. What happens is we have some students that get an extra period of math every other day. They get an extra period of math every day. And they have to come after school for math because the differentiation can't happen in the classroom as it used to because of the, um, the, the, develop, the, the developmentally appropriateness or lack thereof of the Common Core Learning Standards. So it has a cascading effect on lots of other aspects of the operation of the school and the way we deliver instruction as a school. Okay, last question. Have you looked at the Engage New York and have you looked at how they put this together? I mean, it's grammatically incorrect. It has, like here, count the apples and each tree circle the numbers. There are no numbers. 
okay? This other one says, uh, color and count the white circles blue. How do I do that? <laughs> but this is the nonsense that they're Carol, I didn't give you the answer to that question, so. The color, the blue, the white circles? I, you know, I, I think, um, I think we'd like to have better access to better resources. Okay, thanks, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. And next up, we can have uh, Susan Dugo. Uh, Susan? You know, if anybody needs us to interpret for our Long Island colleagues, just let us know. <laughs> oh, yeah.
As a teacher, I could use some help also. I love teaching. I have taught for over 25 years. It is my lifelong passion. I see and hear others that feel the same way. The passion is what makes us great. Back to the concept of motivation again. That's what makes my students great too. And as I look around at the overworked and stressed teachers around me, I am sad to see what is happening in my profession. High standards are essential. That is not the problem. The pro um, hard work is admirable. That is not the problem. The problem is in the one-size-fits-all formulas for students, teachers, learning, and assessments. The individuality is what makes America great. In the 1980s, when I first started teaching, I was told how behind in science and math our nation was compared to all the other countries. While a creative thought, which is now the internet, was born, which generated money from American educated individuals to keep us strong. Many new jobs were created. Creativity and individualism helped to keep us great, not conformity. So I say, use the diversity to strengthen the learning and teaching of students. Don't wipe it out. Embrace the passion that meetings such as these are invoking. We need to be passionate about education in our future. Please help us to do this with implementation of a change in policy. If one person or one group of people is unhappy, it could be something about them. But if everyone is unhappy, it seems that it is the system and leadership that needs a change. Help. Just uh, one quick question. What, what grade do you teach? I teach fourth grade. Okay, so I, I think that's actually a perfect uh, uh, age group to ask this question, actually, because our previous speaker uh, mentioned um, that children don't learn backwards. Um, but in addition, when something like this is implemented, um, we're almost relying on the falsehood that that fourth grader has already learned some of these common core, uh, you know, standards in third grade and second grade and first grade. And I was wondering if you could just uh, highlight or speak a little bit about you know, what types of issues are coming up in terms of taking time away from instruction time to teach things that theoretically uh, would have been taught in, in other grades, but they haven't been because every grade is getting uh, forced to adopt this new curriculum all at once. We are teaching um, module one for the ELA, and it's a social studies curriculum um, about Native Americans. And the first thing that you need to know is our social studies curriculum has not taught that yet. And it talks about the Revolutionary War. That has not been taught yet. So basically what the teachers have to do is we have to spend at least an hour to change and fix the um, core curriculum objectives and instruction, everything that we're doing, to still be able to carry them out so the kids can understand it. So that's taking a lot of time. And that's just for basic things. We also have to add all of this, or parts of it, the social studies curriculum. And in my school, we divide up in, um, I teach the science to three other, you know, for three classes, because um, we switch for um, the content areas. And then there's a social studies teacher and a writing teacher. And the social studies teacher told me that she has to reteach. We have to also um, bring up concepts that we wouldn't bring up, and that's taking more time. Because they're not getting it younger. It's not developmentally appropriate because they don't understand that, and it's not even in the curriculum for social studies. So she has to continuously um, reteach and correct misconceptions. Um, another thing that we had in our core curriculum is um, in the beginning, it takes a document, which is a primary document written down from oral language from the Iroquois Confederacy. And the students are supposed to read parts of this, which obviously they can't even read some of the vocabulary, and you know you have to have quite a large amount of background to really make it make sense, so then you can then write about it on top of it. There are, some, there are two good books that we have, um, there's information that is, is good, and there are things that they have learned from this, but it is 
In my, in my opinion, it's, it's not the, you're not getting the bang for your buck, basically. And just that quickly then, are you finding that the students are, you know, becoming much more confused than before because they're, they're seeing concepts uh, that they haven't seen before? It definitely, and what, there are lessons that I know that will help with not just some of these social studies concepts that are based from ELA and from writing and from reading, but lessons that we did before that I knew were appropriate, and I'm putting those in, and those are the ones that you can, I can see the most success with. And then we have to, on top of it, do the other, the core curriculum standards, and like you're saying with the time and the differentiation, um, everyone is struggling you know, in, in our building, and it doesn't matter how long you, you have been teaching. Um, people, like I said, they're tired, they're stressed, and, but they love children, and we just do the best that we can, but we're asking for a change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Okay, next we have um, Scott Marsloff. He's the superintendent of schools from Williamsville Central School District. Sorry about the delay. <laughs> uh, my name is Scott Marsloff, and I am the superintendent of schools in the Williamsville Central School District. Uh, school, dis school district in uh, suburban Buffalo, slightly more than 10,000 students. I'm also the parent of a second grader, a fourth grader, and a fifth grader. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, members of the New York State Assembly who are here this evening to hear concerns from educators and parents. New York State adopted the Common uh, Core Standards in 2010, and now, three years later, we are finally starting to talk about whether or not it makes sense for our most precious resource, our children. Proceeding and including this time period, we have had education reform commissions without educators on them, a Regents Reform Agenda that includes the Common Core implementation, changes to teacher and principal evaluation systems that now include student test scores, along with massive decreases in New York State funding for public education. Over the past few years, concerns about the Common Core implementation in New York State have often been dismissed or worse, not even heard. These changes have been implemented swiftly and ferociously with little regard for how they truly impact children. Anyone that speaks up to offer suggestions for improvement or ask for more time to implement these massive systemic changes is painted quickly as an obstructionist, apathetic, or stuck in the status quo. I am not asking you this evening to completely change everything, but clearly, there are actions that can be taken now to make our pre-K pre -K through 12 education system in New York State better for children. Now I have to tell you, I came prepared this evening to speak at length about the Common Core curriculum, not about the Regents Reform Agenda. While there is some information sprinkled in here uh, about the Reform Agenda with APPR and the focus on, on test scores and those sorts of things, most of my uh, discussion is uh, about the Common Core curriculum, and uh, it is the least of our problems. Uh, the Common Core curriculum, there's been many curriculum, uh, cur curricula tried uh, and implemented over decades in New York State and all across the country. We just recognized a teacher in Williamsville at our recent Board of Education meeting. Uh, Mrs. Syracuse is in her 41st year as a teacher in New York State in all of Williamsville. And um, she lamented how she's been through something called individualization. Never heard of that. Criterion reference, not sure what she's talking about. Continuous progress, all right, now I'm starting to catch up. 
whole language and the common core. All those different um, initiatives, changes, really, um, while there was some discussion about them, uh, have never been to the point where they are today. Um, because let's be clear, the issue uh, is less about the Common Core curriculum implement implementation, and more about the stress and anxiety that everyone is under and the pressure that educators, uh, parents, um, students are perceiving, rather real or perceived, uh, the pressure that they're under to produce results. And uh, quite frankly, I'm surprised we haven't had uh, more situations uh, like they've had in Atlanta, in Washington, D.C., uh, where there's been widespread allegations of cheating on the test because there's much at stake. The Common Core standards uh, represent a core set of academic standards that were nationally and internationally benchmarked. They provide a common foundation and are intended to be the central or most, most important elements of a district's curriculum. The federal government's Common Core initiative also gave each state the flexibility to add to this core set of standards. In turn, New York State has given school districts the ability uh, to focus on their own unique interests and best respond to the needs of their students. For example, in Williamsville, we are implementing the modules for ELA, but not in mathematics. Uh, also in the Williamsville Central School District, teachers, administrators, and district staff responded immediately when New York State adopted the Common Core standards by forming curriculum teams and by developing and providing professional development for our teachers um, prior to the implementation statewide. As a result of this work, teams refined and expanded their focus on a various topics at each grade level as needed to either respond to any potential gaps from the previous standards or to address areas in which students might encounter challenges. Uh, because this type of curriculum work is recursive, again, we've been doing it for decades, this was and continues to be co a coordinated and focused effort among our teachers and administrators. Overall, within our district, the Common Core has been found to be a well-structured set of standards that are causing educators to better focus their instruction and reflect more deeply on the processes and practices of teaching students across content areas. Like any set of standards, they are not perfect. Education research, which includes curriculum enhancement, continues to evolve. And at a minimum, the Common Core, we believe, has encouraged greater rigor and higher degrees of critical thinking than ever before. It is important to note that in addition to implementing the Common Core standards, the state required school districts to simultaneously implement new assessments, a new evaluation system for teachers and principals, as well as other unfunded mandates. The effect of this change on people cannot be ignored. Unfortunately, school districts were at the mercy of the state implementation uh, timeline, which is simply too fast. Um, the state's timeline was unrealistic for any district to implement the Common Core standards to the fullest extent. In feedback given directly to Dr. John King and Ken Slintz from the State Education Department by our district staff, it was shared that the State Education Department's implementation timeline was too hurried and would not provide districts the necessary time to adequately prepare curriculum and materials. It is our understanding that the Common Core authors themselves suggested that there would be great difficulty with effective implementation of the Common Core prior to September 2013. In response, Dr. King and Mr. Slentz reasoned that New York State was awarded race to the top money based on its proposed timeline. They also said that students did not deserve to wait another year for the Common Core, stating, we don't have time to waste, too many kids are failing. This has unfortunately become the common refrain heard when initiative needs to be rushed along in its implementation. As stated earlier, as stated earlier, anyone that asks for a reasonable time frame to reasonably implement such a large change as the Common Core implementation, you are quickly dismissed as someone who does not desire accountability or simply wants to maintain the status quo. Our concern and one shared among school districts is the inefficient time to effectively unpack the standards, write new curriculum, develop and deliver professional development, 
uh, and identify or build resources to de deliver the curriculum. Although you may hear that the Common Core was around since 2010, not one Common Core module was, was released by the New York State Education Department prior to September 2012. And even then, the new modules were released, were released piecemeal throughout last school year, along, by the way, with five different changes to the 135-page New York State Education Department guidance document for ADPR. A longer implementation window would have afforded districts the time to adequately respond to professional development needs and actually allow teachers to adjust their practice before implementing new assessments, unproven assessments at that, connected to their evaluations. While testing has always been a present in New York State, some students uh, may experience test anxiety. Uh, students' attitudes towards learning largely, I don't believe, are shaped by tests. Rather, attitudes are shaped by their experiences and the messages they receive from those around them. The Common Core standards have resulted in an increased focus on content develop, development. Some of these instructional pro approaches, such as helping students develop a deeper conceptual understanding of content, take more effort on everyone's part, certainly by teachers, students, and parents, and may cause students a certain level of challenge, which in turn is unsettling to some of us. The new state test, or any large shift in curriculum or instructional practice, can bring about negative reactions if teachers do not acquire the necessary information, skills, or background knowledge to adapt their instruction. Also, we cannot ignore another major concern about this assessments, which stems from how test scores are now being used as a component of evaluations. This has caused teachers to feel a great deal of additional pressure as it relates to the outcome of the test. One of the other major flaws of the New York State testing protocols is that teachers, administrators, school boards do not get to see the results of the tests. The State Education Department only recent releases about 25% of the items because they want to reuse questions for future tests. This practice unfortunately defeats the best purpose of assessment, especially in grades three through eight, when the assessment should be used as a tool to improve teaching and learning. <laughs> Another item related to testing protocol is timeliness. Certainly districts have been in a great hurry to implement all of this as required by the New York State Education Department. However, I would ask that the State Education Department be in a little bit more hurry to provide timely feedback to students, parents, and school districts. They actually moved the test from May until April in order to provide themselves with more time to calculate the results and provide those to districts, teachers, and parents in a more timely way. Providing these results five months later is not helpful nor meaningful. Local district administrators um, have been instrumental in implementing the Common Core, working together with teachers, uh, principals uh, and others have done a tremendous job. Uh, in terms of the financial aspect, funding to support all of these efforts was and continues to be a major consideration as monies from race to the top were very limited. Uh, you heard Mr. Cornell mention $700 million. Not much of that uh, got to the school district level. In our school district, uh, we had slightly more than $70,000 that was provided to the Williamsville School District that was doled out over a three-year period. The cost of implementation for the region's reform agenda is well over $1 million in counting. Certainly during the most prolonged period of financial retrenchment for school districts in recent history, these added costs are incredibly difficult for school districts to grapple with. While the, leader, the, while the demands of the Common Core implementation uh, demands, uh, time of principals, curriculum leaders, and others has been enormous. The amount of time spent working together on the quagmire also represents one of the bright spots about the reform agenda. Principals and teachers are having many more conversations about what excellent teaching and learning should look like at all levels of our school district. In Williamsville, for example, our administrators and teachers collaborated on selecting a teacher evaluation rubric. Training was held and follow-up occurred. Observations and follow-up discussions with teachers now take place at least twice per year 
rather than once every three years. Uh, I also, lastly, would like to talk about student data, something that I'm uh, quite passionate about. In Waynesville, every effort is made to keep student data secure and follow mandated data collection processes and reporting requirements. <coughs> if you like, I can provide for you a list of reports that our school district and all school districts in New York State provide to the State Education Department. It is enormous. For many years, um, all school districts have been required to submit information to both state and federal agencies. Regarding the new education data portal in New York State, there is great concern regarding the reporting of data to outside entities and security of data that is kept by third party vendors such as InBloom. There is no per parental opt out option for this New York State Education Department initiative. Despite repeated assurances by the state, no one can guarantee that the information will be secure. Just look at the issues of confidentiality at the federal level. What happens to the data in the future? Does it become part of a national tracking database or could it be sold someday to another company or to advertisers? Could the data be used to uh, be held against a student later in life when applying for college or even a job? These are just a few of the major concerns that I have as not only the superintendent of schools, but also as a parent. In addition, like many districts, <coughs> we already have a parent and teacher portal developed by and customized for our school district. The Waynesville Information Tracking System maintains all required data and is compliant with all state and federal reporting requirements. The InBloom program would be an expensive redundancy, mandated cost, between one and five dollars per student for our school district and represents yet another unfunded state mandate. As a superintendent of schools and a parent of three young children, I believe student and parent data, by the way, is sacrosanct. The Waynesville School District has no plans to share this confidential information with a third party vendor and I urge the State Education Department to reconsider this ill-conceived initiative. I also urge you to pass legislation immediately to protect the privacy of our parents and our children. In conclusion, I'll echo some of the other comments. Please slow these initiatives down. Appoint a group of educators to study the Common Core, APPR, and other recent systemic changes. <laughs> Eliminate the need to share data with third party vendors. Insist that any new mandate or initiative that comes from New York State be thoroughly studied with true input from teachers in the field. Lastly, please consider becoming a leader in changing the tenor of conversation regarding public education. It has become popular to attack teachers, administrators, and our entire public education system. While there is always room for growth and improvement, like there is everywhere, we need to stop vilifying those who are trying to shape the minds of our children and prepare them for the challenges of the future. Lastly, I will mention that at 4.47 p.m. this evening, while I was in line at Wegmans before I came here, I received an email from Pearson informing me that I needed to provide 41 new field tests for our students in Williamsville this school year, 34 of which will be online. I can't believe that this continues to move forward with online testing. Haven't we learned from what's going on with healthcare? Thank you very much. Um, just a, an FYI too, the, this past year, uh, session, the assembly did pass a bill uh, that would protect student data. Um, I don't know if it, did it go through the Senate? I don't think it went, the Senate didn't take that up or didn't pass it, but uh, there are efforts on our side, in our house, to, to move forward, and, and I think you bring up some very, very valuable points on that. Um, just another issue too, uh, in case anyone wasn't, didn't know this, um, when we were negotiating the budget, uh, this past spring, uh, one uh, proposal that the governor had made uh, would be to have 
the give each district the ability to waive any reporting requirements that that they didn't deem necessary all they needed to do was send a letter to the state at saying you know for these reasons we do not uh believe it's necessary for us to provide these reports that piece of language was ultimately taken out of the bill uh and was not included in the final budget that's something i know my office has brought up and some of my colleagues offices have brought up that is something that i don't think we should let drop either i think it's up to the local districts to decide what you need to do and, and if you don't have the flexibility to make those decisions uh then you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of uh costs going forward that that aren't necessary so i, I do want you to know that on the assembly side and particularly our minority parents we are very very nervous as well so thank you very much i appreciate your comments does anyone uh raise that scott good to see you again i've always looked up to you <laughs> that, that was a cheap one steve thank you very much uh two questions how much is um this uh, implementation cost your, di your district? And secondly, how much have you received back in funding? Uh, yeah, in Race to the Top funding, we've received a little more than $70,000 over a three year period. Uh, in terms of what we've spent, uh, we're over, well over a million dollars and counting. In terms of professional development for teachers, time to create assessments, time to write curriculum, uh, time to have professional development around the, the modules, um, time to grade assessments. Um, my largest concern, um, besides the student data piece that I, I didn't share, um, has to do with time. We have way too much time where our teachers are being taught by substitute teachers in order to get all the other things done in terms of training. So as educators, we, we tend to do what we're told and we want to do things right. So in order to do it the right way, we have to take this time uh, to, to work with our teachers. And so we've done that, but uh, in the end, it's the children who are suffering because uh, they don't have their, their first team teacher, so to speak. They're, they're working with a substitute all too often. Unfunded mandates over and over again, we hear at the local level, whether it's school districts, whether it's municipalities, over and over and over again, the pushback, the cost comes back to you and me. Uh, and this can't continue on. We, we of course, were promised uh, several years ago that if we implemented the tax cap, the unfunded mandate relief would follow soon thereafter. We're not holding our breath because we'd all be passed out by now. Keep up the good work in Williamsville. Good to see you again. Thank you. This one too. The um, how much you anticipate is going to cost you move forward from here to implement the common core. Uh, that's difficult to predict. Certainly, um, we are going to continue with professional development. We have the module implementation that we're doing for ELA, uh, not for mathematics. Um, also, the whole online testing piece, and there are uh, significant costs to implementing that um, in terms of what types of devices can be used, that keyboards have to be part of the devices, uh, so on and so forth. Um, all of the, uh, the data that has to be reported on student-teacher linkages, but based on how much time uh, a teacher spends with a particular student, all of that has to be organized uh, in a meaningful way and provided back uh, to the state education department as well. So there are tremendous hidden costs behind the scenes as well uh, of things that districts have to do. Uh, we're fortunate in Williamsville, we have um, good resources in our school district. Uh, I'm not sure how other districts are getting this done. I worked in a small school district before I came to Williamsville and it's, it, has, it must be an enormous undertaking, uh, particularly for some of our smaller districts. Did you price out the data mining? I'm sorry? Did you price out the amount it would cost you for the data mining to hire an outside company? Um, it's, it's between a dollar and five dollars per student. You get four choices among companies. There's Datacation, InBloom, a couple other ones, and they, they range in cost from one to five dollars per student. So for us, it would be between about $10,000 and $50,000 to provide them our data. I'd like to know where that uh, ten to fifty thousand dollars is to do their field test for them. Uh, I think Pearson should pay for that. Uh, just two more things. Uh, you get pushback from the parents on the data mining part of this. 
lot of parents saying, I don't want my child's information put out there? I don't know if it was pushback. I think it's more support because this is one uh, area where we've tried to get out in front. Um, one of the things I was told by an official from the state education department is you'll be sacrificing the rest of your race to the top dollars that you haven't spent yet. And I said, well, that's fine because we spent all of ours already. Well, it costs so, you more than that. Uh, the last one, Board of Regents announced today that they're going to be cutting the test, time for the test, and they're going to be cutting the tests you know, what the kids are going to be tested on, but they're going to be cutting the time of the test by 10 minutes. Any reaction to that? Um, you know, to me, it's like trying to empty out Lake Ontario with a teaspoon or a water hose. Um, it's, it's a small little piece, perhaps as a signal that they're, they're hearing some of the concerns. The tests have gotten longer. And students, if, if also uh, up to 25%, for example, in mathematics, have 25% less time to complete them. So are we asking students to really to show what they know um, and what they can do, or are we asking them how fast they can do something? Um, you know, it's <laughs> so there's, there's that concern. And I'd like to see the state education department take a little bit more of an aggressive approach uh, certainly third grade is a little bit young for the state tests. Um, fourth grade, um, I think uh, we could live with that. Uh, I think maybe fourth, sixth, and eighth. Let's start there. Um, let's look at three through eight testing. You know, I share with parents all the time that, yeah, there's AIS implications and things of that nature, but at the end of the day, the performance of a child on a three through eight test is not going to determine what college they get into. Uh, they're going to have enough high stakes exams to, to, to high school and start taking high school credit bearing courses. That's when really it does get high stakes and, you know, we start really uh, sorting and classifying students, I guess. But um, I really think we could uh, uh, reduce the, the number of tests that are given, particularly in the three through eight grade range. I understand the need for some testing. We spend $55 billion a year state on public education, there needs to be some type of measurement. Uh, I understand that. But uh, right now, uh, there's too much pressure, too much anxiety, and uh, we need to, to reduce that. Scott, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. Okay, uh, next we have Heidi and Delicato. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I apologize if I messed that up. Sorry. And as Heidi's walking up to the podium, I have to apologize. You know, I'm so interested in what everyone's having to say. We're running behind schedule, and I have like 15 people who have requested to speak, and I'm supposed to leave the room here at 8 o'clock. So if I could just ask everyone who's going to be speaking, if you just keep your comments uh, as succinct as possible, that would be helpful. I don't want to miss out on anybody who, who requested to speak. So thank you very much. Heidi? Hi. Thank you for hosting this educational forum. And I might have to fumble a little bit with the mic after following Mr. Marsloff because obviously I'm as tall as he is. <laughs> so here I go. Let me just, okay. Uh, I feel a little intimidated as well. I am a parent in Lancaster, New York. I am not a teacher. I'm not a superintendent or principal. I'm an RN. I have a degree in Bachelor of Science, which I sometimes struggle with too in helping my children with their homework. Funny thing. Um, my husband and I have three boys nine, six, and three. And I just wanted to start with a comment that Arnie Duncan made to a group of state school superintendents. He says he finds it fascinating that some of the opposition to the, to the uh, Common Core state standards has come from, and I quote, white suburban moms who all of a sudden, their child isn't as brilliant as they thought they were, doesn't really make sense, that statement. And their school isn't quite as good as they thought it was. That is truly an appalling, not to mention racist and sexist remark coming from the Secretary of Education of the This to me demonstrates a true disconnect and disrespect from Mr. Duncan and shows just how out of touch government is in regards to local level education. I attended a very informative educational summit for partnerships for smarter schools in Buffalo at Kleinhands, which 
Um, there were 2,500 people in attendance. People of all color were there. Mothers and fathers were present. This white suburban mom was present. And while I want my children to succeed, the priority in our home is always do your best, <laughs> enjoy school, and we will always be proud of you. People have left New York State in hopes of having a better life and more employment opportunity to only return to New York State because of our excellence in education. The government manufactured a crisis with manipulated data, and the unmanipulated data proved that. Our local school district of Lancaster was improving its numbers and had success before Race to the Top and Common Core state standards were started. I could go on for hours of the problems and defects of the current educational reform many already have. I would instead like to present to you observations we have made in our district as parents, educators, and healthcare professionals. <clears throat> Children are becoming defeated. Children are becoming disengaged. Children are becoming depressed. Children are becoming more anxious. Children are losing their self-worth. Children are regressing. And children are being left behind. These are the truths of the children that are overwhelmed by countless test prep assessments. These are the truths of those children that cannot be helped by their teachers simply because there is not enough time nor resources. What about the children that are gifted that are so overwhelmed, like they said, about double workload that they can't take it anymore and think of taking their own life? Yes, there have been children that thought that and have been admitted to the hospital. This curriculum narrows and creates a one-size-fits-all approach to education. Every child is a unique individual and learns at a different pace. Experts have stated the curriculum, especially in the younger, more vulnerable ages, is a developmentally inappropriate curriculum. It is a program that goes beyond their prefrontal cortex development. I ask you, why is this okay? Why do we expect, accept this flawed curriculum? More rigor? Rigor. Rigor is defined as a difficult and unpleasant condition or experiences. Strictness or severity. A harsh or cruel act. This is not a word I want attached to my child's curriculum. <laughs> These state assessments demonstrated this very definition by making eight, nine, ten-year-olds sit there for 90 minutes and special needs doubling that time for six days taking tests that were above their level of educational ability. This is child abuse in my mind. The fact is, we adopted the Common Core standards and its assessments sight unseen to ensure race to the top funding, taxpayer money, mind you, during a recession. No one looked at its validity and no one saw the lack of transparency and accountability. But we do now. Thousands upon thousands of educators, administrators, healthcare professionals, and parents report those concerns daily. The Board of Regent Lester Young Jr., who was in attendance at the kids meeting with Commissioner King, stated it best. He stated that all good ideas live and die by execution. We want to hear how it's going in the field. Really? Who is listening? Not the commissioner, not the New York State Education Department, and not the governor. They do not want to admit they made a mistake. The government suspended the health care exchange because they saw mistakes and flaws. We've had many apologies from the president. Why are we not doing the same with something as important as education? The very thing that is shaping the future of America. They need to admit there are flaws and work with the local educators as they all stand up and share their concerns. Why are we not listening to all these professionals in the, in the business of education? Bill Gates said it himself. We will not know if this curriculum will be beneficial for possibly 10 years. My children and your children 
don't have 10 years. They will never get these precious years back. This is why I will not vote for anyone who supports the substandard curriculum, nor anyone who does nothing to help fix it. All assessments should be designed by the New York educators at the local level that have, that have proficiency levels based on a raw score and set prior to the administration of the test and be available to educators, children, and families immediately after it is given. This is the only way teachers and parents can measure the strengths and weaknesses of the child. Tests that are developmentally inappropriate, sealed, and that, make, that makes teachers sign affidavits to not discuss with anyone are not tests I will allow my children to take. They will refuse these tests. And they will refuse these flawed and invalid assessments every year until they're gone. I urge you all to visit the classroom and talk with the teachers and listen to the concerns of the parents of how these standards and assessments are proving to be harmful to our children. We need your support in proposing bills and support in telling the New York State Education Department and the governor we need change now. We need to get testing right and bring back local control in our schools. All of these innocent little lives depend on it. Thank you. Next we have uh, Lorraine Gamick uh, coming, a teacher, Lorraine. I hope I'm saying that name right. There we go. Thank you, Lorraine. My name is Lorraine Gamick, and I am a teacher at Batavia High School. And I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, in New York State, we all know that all students are assessed. 98% of the students in the state take the Regents exam at the high school and other state assessments in the lower grades. I am a teacher of students who take the New York State Alternate Assessment, or the NISA, as it's called by state ed. According to section 100.1 of the regulation of the Commissioner of Education, a NISA eligible student is defined as a student with severe disabilities. And, to, and refers to students who have limited cognitive abilities combined with behavioral and or physical limitations and require highly specialized education and or social, psychological, and medical services in order to maximize their full potential for useful and meaningful participation in society and for self-fulfillment. Students with severe disabilities may experience severe speech, language, and or perceptual cognitive impairments and challenging behaviors that interfere with learning and socialization opportunities. These students may also have extremely fragile psychological conditions and may require personal care, physical, verbal supports, and assistive, assistive technology. Approximately one to 2% of the students in the state fall into this category. So it's a very small group of people. The students in this category that are able to have a career could be in jobs similar to the cart person at your grocery store, or they would be employed at the ARC in a workshop, or in a daycare facility like we have um, in, in Elba, New York. I can't say it strongly enough. Our severely handicapped students are being excessively assessed. This year, the NISA is aligned to the Common Core State Standards in English and Math. In the 2013-14 school year, a high school age student, severely handicapped, will take 28 state assessments. They will do 14 baseline assessments and 14 post assessments. And they are as follows. In English, they will do 10 assessments. In math, they will do 10 assessments. In science, they will do four assessments. And in social studies, they will do four assessments. These assessments are starting in grade three, and they have, are assessed yearly until grade eight. When they reach high school, they are assessed once in their high school career, and that is in the year that they turn 18. The NYSA testing areas are math and English at the elementary level, 
math, English, and science at the middle school level, math, English, science, and social studies at the high school level. And each of those levels is divided into a level of complexity. So for example, high school math, I have the less complex level, the middle complex level, and the more complex <coughs> level, depending on the students, um, their disability and what they are able to do. One of the issues that we are facing this year is, if any, when I came back to my principal and talked about this, they were like, no, this can't be. We have to create the assessments. This year, well, I only have one student that falls in, into being 18 years old during this assessment period. <coughs> it is conceivable that there are high school teachers who will have to create 42 baseline assessments and 42 post-assessments that must be approved by their superintendent prior to